Welcome to Bible class at the Greenberry Church of Christ. I think I've got everything ready and we will be able to move along in our reading of the book of Acts. I really do appreciate your presence this morning, wherever you are, uh, wherever in our classroom or uh, in, in uh, wherever you are, <laughs> I guess in, in the cloud. Uh, I really do appreciate your presence. It's been a blessing for me to be able to read through the book of Acts and I hope you've enjoyed it with me as well. Uh, we're, we're at a part of the book of Acts that really has had a tremendous influence on our fellowship. And it, when I say that, it's had a tremendous influence on my life. So it's going to be a, a, a great uh, thing for us to read Acts chapter 20. Uh, at least get started on it. I'm not sure we'll conclude it, but we'll get started on the Ephesus Chronicles Concluded, which is how I would uh, characterize Acts uh, 21 through 38. And as you'll see in a moment, there's about half of the chapter that doesn't have anything to do with Ephesus, other than the fact that Paul leaves Ephesus and comes back to, to people who are from Ephesus. But you'll see how that develops. Let's all read together now. I would like for you to read this aloud with me, Acts chapter 1. Verse 8, this is Jesus' agenda for all that we've been reading. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And of course, we have been at the ends of the earth uh, in the last several lessons. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father in heaven, hallowed be your name this good day. What a blessing it is, Father, to come together to worship you, to remember on this first day of the week the sacrificial love of our Lord and Savior who did for us what we could not do and did it so graciously and humbly before you in complete submission to your will. I pray, Father, that we will learn from our Lord and walk in the way that he has walked that we indeed will humble ourselves before you and pray, not our will, but yours be done. Holy Father in heaven, I pray that you will forgive us of our sins. You know better than we how often we are high-minded and want to go our own ways instead of being humble before you. And I pray, Father, that you will forgive us. Father, we're so grateful that, that we've been blessed with so many things. Uh, we're grateful, Lord, that uh, as we pray, give us this day our daily bread. It's really thank you, Father, this day for our daily bread. We pray, Lord, that uh, as we walk through this world and live amongst people in our community and in our congregation, that we will be generous in every way, generous of our means, generous of our 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 attitudes, our spirits, generous of love because you have been so generous toward us. And now, Lord, as we continue to read through the book of Acts, help us to gather that which we need to learn. And when we see places where we need to turn around and go in your direction, oh, Father, give us the wisdom and the courage to do that very thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it all started with... Paul came to Ephesus and he went to the synagogue. Uh, when the synagogue sort of turned him out, uh, he went to the hall of Tyrannus. We'll read about that in just a second. One of the things in the previous lesson that was of, of note were the extraordinary miracles done by God through Paul. I, I really need to edit that. I, don't, I won't take the time to do that right now because the text actually says... Uh, God did these extraordinary miracles through Paul, by the hands of Paul. And that's what it needs to say. And that kind of set up that humorous little incident with the seven sons of Sceva, who had uh, sort of anointed himself a high priest. And they were Jewish uh, magicians, uh, kind of hucksters who would go uh, from one place to the other. I think the text says it, doesn't it say... They were itinerant uh, folk going from here to there, uh, using magic as they could to deceive people and make a buck. And all of that, though, <clears throat> after 
after those things happened, and after Paul actually responded, well, I would say, uh, well, Paul didn't respond to it, did he? Uh, actually, the spirit that they were trying to cast out did and kind of settled that whole matter, but it did bring a lot of attention to the Apostle Paul and what he was doing and what he was preaching particularly, and people turned to the Lord. And about that time, uh, Paul, had, after having been at Ephesus uh, a long time, uh, he served in the hall, or he used the hall of Tyrannus for, for uh, two years. Uh, but he decided, I must also see Rome. And what that meant was he was going to go up through Macedonia and over to Achaia and then uh, go to Syria and Palestine or to Jerusalem. And in order, to, he actually has a project in mind, we'll talk about that in just a minute. He sent Timothy and Erastus ahead of him uh, to be kind of the advance party for what he wanted to do. And then after they left, there is a big riot in Ephesus, which really is a testimony to the power of the gospel influencing that community. And a fellow named Demetrius, who was a silversmith, who carved these little idols or cast, probably cast metal idols, uh, images of the goddess Artemis, he, he became concerned because uh, Paul had preached in such manner and with uh, such preaching that indicated those idols are nothing and just throw that away and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, he was pretty worried about his future business. And so he stirred up a riot that actually settled in the, in the, in the favor of those who followed the Lord Jesus Christ in that the uh, town clerk of Ephesus stepped in and really provided some protection to them all in all of that. And so one of the things that Luke is probably communicating to Theophilus is the fact that uh, Christianity was no real threat or no, uh, I would say, immediate threat or rebellious threat against the Roman order. They were not uh, attempting to overthrow Rome, but of course we know that if you sow the seed of light in a dom dominion of darkness, eventually uh, it's going to be transformed and, and uh, that's, that's what was going on. So, bigger story than, than, but the kind of the seeds of all that in a sense are being planted there in the city of Ephesus and many other places so it would happen. So, the remainder of this journey will take Paul back through Macedonia. You see right here uh, the city of Ephesus. He's going to go back to uh, actually Macedonia is right up here, which means then that he's going to go back across the top portion of the Aegean Sea and uh, land at Neapolis, which is basically uh, that was considered the port city of Philippi. Head his way on up to Philippi, go to Thessalonica, now, when it says he was going to Achaia, uh, then that could have meant he went to Athens, but it's pretty clear in the map. This map does not consider the fact that he even went to Athens, though Athens was in Achaia. But uh, we do know that he went to Corinth, and we know that from the letters that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And so uh, that's, that's the, the outbound journey is the, is the solid line. And the, and the return journey is going to be the dotted line that will actually bring him back to the uh, region of Ephesus. Uh, he doesn't actually go to Ephesus on his return, on his way to Syria and Caesarea Philippi. Uh, not Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea, the, the port city that served Jerusalem. So he's going to head back in that direction. And we'll see a map here later on about about that. In fact, here it is. Uh, he'll he'll actually meet right there in Miletus with the elders from the church in Ephesus. He bypasses um, Ephesus so they can meet with him in Miletus, and then notice Kos, Rhodes, uh, Patara, a port city down to Tyre, down to Ptolemais, down to Caesarea. We'll say a word about. It the detail that is noted in the text at this point. Uh, and the detail is there simply because in Acts 20 verse 5, uh, it starts reading we again, which means that at that point of leaving Miletus, 
or about the time you would say he got to Miletus, Luke was part of the group. So it's a big, a big loop that Paul had made. Actually, in a sense, it all started back here at Jerusalem, back to Antioch in Syria, and made his way over, uh, uh, stayed in Ephesus, uh, went to Ephesus, made the loop up into Macedonia and Achaia, and then back. And uh, I think you could kindly kind of rough that out to being about 1,900 miles of travel or more. Actually, I saw one chart that worked it out to be uh, over 2,000 miles of travel. Uh, as I've already noted in previous lessons, uh, uh, Witherington, Ben Witherington calls this section of the book of Acts, the Ephesus Chronicles. Uh, part one is the episode about Apollos along with Priscilla and Aquila. And then part two, the Baptist's disciples. That's the beginning of chapter 19. And Paul's interaction with, that, with them in order to bring them uh, to complete understanding about the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And then part three is the Paul turning to the Jews and Gentiles after I think about a month or three months, was it? Check me on that, y'all. Y'all need to open up your Bible and watch and see how, how uh, closely I'm paying attention to the text. But he, he was in the synagogue for a little while, but as we well know, he's not always going to stay in most synagogues. Most of them will turn him out. And he will go to the Gentiles, and that was the episode or period of time in the Hall of Tyrannus. And then there's this episode regarding the seven sons of Sceva that was prompted by Paul's, uh, the, the, the working of miracles by God through Paul. I really need to emphasize that because I think that's, that's exactly how Luke wants us to read all of that. And then you get to part five and there's the riot in Ephesus. And then there's really this interlude, which I just sketched out on the map, the interlude up into Macedonia and Achaia. I should add Achaia to, to my chart there. And then, and that's verses 1 through 16 of chapter 20. And then the, the, the conclusion of, of these things that kind of revolve around Ephesus would be Paul's meeting with the elders from the churches in Ephesus, but he doesn't meet with them in Ephesus. He meets with them in Miletus. And so, also have already mentioned, but I think it's worth mentioning again, because uh, part of this, um, uh, well, Witherington is, is the one who makes the observation, this is kind of the summit of Paul's ministry and missionary work as a free man. It's the longest stable period of time that he is in, in any place. He fully carries out his commission to the Jew first and also to the Greek especially to the Greek. That's why he was called by the Lord Jesus Christ. But I think it's, it's really worth uh, watching what happens in 19 and 20 for there are elements of that that are truly a lasting model for ministry that are good in every place, in every time. And that's why I think the value of kind of, of going over that again and reminding us of it. So let's read, starting with verse 1 of chapter 20. Recall now that there was an uproar. Uh, it's been quieted by the town clerk. And after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. And after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. And when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria... He decided to return through Macedonia. And then there are details given here uh, about those who traveled with him. Sopater, the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarch Aristarchus, and Segundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, and Tychicus, and Trophimus, these went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. Notice that little bitty shift right there in verse 5. They went ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of the unleavened bread. So I don't, it seems to me that probably Luke had joined these folk at Troas, which is actually 
where he joined Paul initially back in chapter 16. But maybe he joined them there, or it could have been Philippi as well. Uh, but uh, and I, I need to kind of edit myself as I go along here, waiting for us at Troas. So it's Troas, isn't it? And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of the unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. So, after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. So, we go directly from uh, that episode into this transition period where Paul is going to leave where he had been serving so faithfully and so effectively and fruitfully. He's going to depart and go to Macedonia, as I'll share some notes here in a minute. He has a project in mind and he wants to advance that project. And so he goes through all of those regions. Actually, Luke in his report here couples a lot of miles with the briefest of reports, certainly a lot of events, a lot of meetings with brethren along the way. Uh, but what it actually means is Paul had an opportunity to go back and visit the church in Philippi, visit the church in Thessalonica as well. And those are the the, the churches we know about in that region. And I'm confident that by that time, there could well have been others. And then he came to Greece, and there he spent uh, three months. As I said a moment ago, it could include Athens, because Athens was in, a Greek, in Greece or Achaia. But every indication to me here is that that's not where he went. He was intending to go back to the church in Corinth. In fact, I believe you can work it out in the Corinthian letters that he really wanted to go back there and to attend to some current concerns that he'd heard about after other uh, co-workers of his had been to, to Corinth and caught, brought back to him various reports. And so he, he really did want to go back to Corinth and attend to some things there. And so here he is then in Corinth and, and, and was wanting to go to set sail for Syria, which if... If, if he had uh, gone the way he did previously, that means going down to the little port of Sincrea and catching a boat and then heading to the eastern part of the, uh, Medi into the eastern Mediterranean. But there was some kind of plot made against him by the Jews. That's kind of an odd, uh, you know, how, leave by, by ship or by foot. <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe going by foot was maybe a little safer. I don't know. You would think ship would be, although I'm pretty sure that the uh, possibility of pirate activity would have been at work there. So anyway, he decides to return to Macedonia. In other words, he just retraces his route to go back in the direction of Troas and uh, in the direction of, uh, of Ephesus. Well, in 1 Corinthians 16.1, now concerning the collection for the saints, this is, uh, I, I, I'm not really going to take the time because we have to actually piece this together from what Paul wrote about it because interestingly enough, Luke doesn't say a word about it, which is a bit puzzling because this, uh, from Paul's letters, especially 1 and 2 Corinthians, and also the matter came up in Galatians, uh, uh, it was a really important project, and it, it had a really uh, serious and important uh, uh, purpose in it, in that uh, all the way back to Acts 15, and James kind of settled the controversy there with this letter and with the request that, what above all, just remember the poor, is what James had said, and, and that's what Paul is doing here. He's, he's remembering the poor saints in Judea. And so he's taking up money from Gentile churches to deliver to the church in Jerusalem and in Judea. And, uh, and that serves two purposes. First of all, we're honoring our uh, love for you by helping you out as much as we can. And it also kind of serves to as a unifying uh, action. Uh, a way to kind of b bring those people together. And that was really important for the Apostle Paul. I think in the previous lesson I noted that uh, much of Paul's writing, like Romans, Ephesians, uh, 
uh, started to say Philippians. It's really Galatians. All of that writing is, for, for, is, is uh, kind of one of the things at work there is either is to have one church, a united church, not a Gentile church and not a Jewish church. And so this collection for the saints was really impossible. And uh, he told the church in Corinth, uh, you just name who needs to deliver that, who will accredit it, so to speak, or watch over it and faithfully deliver it, and maybe we can all carry it, that gift to Jerusalem. And so that's what he did. When he left uh, Corinth, headed back through Macedonia, they would have been carrying uh, that contribution, that gift to the saints in Judea. And they, they will accompany me. So there's a, a group traveling along to do that. In other words, he is taking uh, great pains to be uh, completely transparent compl with full integrity regarding money that was given for him to carry and deliver or for them for them to carry and deliver, and uh, that, that no one could make any accusation that any of them were, were uh, profiting off of, off of what had been done. And as I say, this is a long time project. It's actually evidence of that even before Paul got to Ephesus. So we notice the kind of the international character of, of this group. There's a, a brother from Berea, and Timothy was from. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, uh, from Berea, which is uh, west of Thessalonica, and then Aristarchus and Segundus from the church in Thessalonica, Gaius of Derby, and Timothy also was from Derby, and then the two two brothers who were from the province of Asia, maybe maybe Ephesus. But again, I underlined, we sailed from Philippi after the day of unleavened bread and what that meant. Uh, they went down to the port city of Neapolis across that northern tip of the Aegean Sea and landed in Troas, which is the next place we're going to spend some time. Landed in Troas, for it was a port city as well. And uh, here's this little episode in Troas. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, he said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and he had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long time until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, and were not a little comforted. On the first day of the week, this is the earliest reference to the fact that Sunday, the day we call Sunday, uh, but the earliest reference that the first day of the week had become the day of assembly for Christians to edify one another, to worship together, and as we see in the next phrase, to break bread together. Uh, in other words, at least half of this congregation, I would say, would be people of a Jewish background who had grown up honoring and keeping the Sabbath. But now those folk, along with Gentile folk, are gathering together on the first day of the week, which is designated the Lord's Day in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. In other words, it is the Lord's Day because on that day the Lord was raised from the dead. And so, uh, no doubt, there were uh, Christian Jews who, who had still thought about the importance of the Sabbath, but, but by now it's obvious that the first day of the week is the day of those who follow the Messiah to assemble together. And it seems like, uh, uh, though 
Luke's uh, writing is kind of charted by, by the Jewish uh, cal uh, calendar, I expect. It's really the Roman means of reckoning time, the time of a day, from midnight until midnight being the marking of one day. And that seems to be the time uh, that he is uh, using here when he reports this story. So Paul talked with them. Uh, no doubt they shared a meal. It would seem to me, because one of the things we need to know or to be aware of is that this assembly probably was at the end of the day, not Sunday morning, because the first day of the week and the rest of the world is a work day. And for some of those folks, especially those members of the church who were slaves, uh, they couldn't take off that morning. They worked. And uh, so the assembly time is very likely toward the end of the day uh, when the work day had sort of settled down and all. Uh, then then uh, uh, everyone could gather together, slave and free. And uh, obviously there's the house of a wealthy person uh, large enough to uh, accommodate this house church and also it, they were they were seated, seated on a third floor area which makes it a pretty pretty large structure for that uh, day and time but here here we have uh, the other thing I want to talk about is this word talked Paul talked with them I think an older translation maybe the King James Version said Paul preached to them well the word there is really not the word that would say be equivalent to proclaiming or preaching. The word is actually a Greek word, diolegomai, which we get into our language as dialogue, which means to converse with, to discourse with, to discuss with, maybe even to argue with. Well, Paul's not arguing with these brethren, but he is discussing it with them. And because this goes on for several hours, uh, then very likely it's more uh, the kind of this is the nature of this assembly was it's more like a Bible class that we experience on a Sunday morning where there's interaction and uh, we, we've had experience with that. And that's probably more of what was going on. I actually think that's it, that that's a good observation for us to be aware of. And that would develop several other lines of thought, which I can't pursue right now. But um he, he, so he dialogued with them, and because he's a guest speaker, because it's the Apostle Paul going through, and we haven't seen him in a long time and all of that, and because he's a guest speaker, he took the liberty to just talk still longer. Uh, fine print, or faded print there. Paul talked still longer, even after... Uh, uh, well, that, that, that talked longer and put Eutychus to sleep, and then after, you know what happens after that as well. Uh, poor Eutychus. <laughs> Can you imagine being the fellow who went to sleep on the Apostle Paul and people 20 centuries later are reading about you? Oh, man, what, what, a, what a reputation. He will be remembered as long as Christians read the Acts of the Apostles as the fellow who went to sleep in church while the Apostle Paul was preaching. And I even have a sermon outline on this that I, I actually borrowed from a good friend and mentor, Jim Hance, who's passed away several years ago, gone on to be, meet the Lord. But here's something that Jim wrote. Let's review what we know about the meeting. It was a night meeting, not what some of us expect but it probably began about sunset. After a day of work, it was an indoor meeting in someone's home after Passover. So it's late spring or early summer. Climate that is similar to ours, but in a house without air conditioning. Luke tells us it was a room on the third floor. It was a lamp lit meeting. What will many lamps do to the temperature and the oxygen supply? Maybe a window seat was a choice seat. So we have, after working all day, a group of people, tired people, some of them, of course, meeting together. Eutychus did not have to be at church that night, yet he chose to be, chose to be with the saints to break bread, to receive the teaching, and to enjoy fellowship. And we may assume he had a love for the Lord, love for the church, love for the truth, but that didn't keep him 
from going to sleep. And we've all been there, haven't we? For less, uh, less time than you, because I would expect. So uh, this prompts my own humorous experience. Before my wife and I moved to, to Granbury, I was the pulpit minister for the Church of Christ in Hamilton, the Park Heights Church of Christ in Hamilton, Texas. And uh, one Sunday morning, one of the elders' granddaughters was visiting. She was about a kindergartner or a first grader, and her grandparents always sat near the front. They were right down there on about the third or fourth row uh, on the right, they were on my right. And uh, th this little girl was sleepy, and so because the pew in front of them was empty, they just let her stretch out on the pew in front of them and go to sleep. And then she started snoring, loudly snoring. But no one could see her. And I could watch folks hearing that and trying to figure out who it was uh, that was asleep and snoring. And usually it was a fellow named Jimmy who actually sat uh, over to my left again on the third or, or row or so, and usually Jimmy went to sleep. And, and everybody kind of kept looking at Jimmy, but he was awake. <laughs> and finally the grandmother uh, poked her and, and she stopped snoring, but everybody kept checking on Jimmy. Having been overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Well, as much fun, so to speak, or our humor that we can find in all this, there's also a very serious part of this. This young man fell three stories and it killed him. But Paul goes down and here Paul is portrayed as being like the great Old Testament prophets like Elijah or Elisha who also raised the dead. Or more to the point, here in the Acts story, He's like Peter in Acts 9 who raised Dorcas from the dead. You see, both these men, the Acts of the Apostles would be the Acts of Peter and the Acts of Paul. And both of these men are portrayed as great and powerful early Christian leaders through whom the power of the Lord was displayed and worked mightily. And in the case of Paul, uh, this is the last miracle that he is said to perform as a free man. From now on, uh, there will be few miracles. There will be one or two, but there will be few miracles. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while. So this meeting actually turned into an all-night meeting and dinner on the ground, so to speak. Now, here is where it is, uh, well, verse 7 and then again in verse 11, the phrase broken bread or breaking bread is used. And I think we've always taken the initial uh, reference to, to indicate not only a, a meal, but also during that meal would be the observance of the Lord's Supper. They would take bread, this is my body, the cup of wine, this is my blood of the covenant, and uh, that's probably what was done at that time. And then, and then another time of breaking bread, which is actually uh, into early Monday morning when, when this happened. Uh, yes, early Monday morning when this happened. So um, that puzzles us just a little bit. Nevertheless, I think it's clear from the way Luke talks about this matter of breaking bread from the beginning of, of the miracle in which Jesus took bread, broke it, blessed it, and gave it to them. All through the Lucan account, and especially from the time of the last Passover up until now, it is talking about the fact that the church came together to observe the Lord's Supper. Well, we might ask, why do we report these kinds of things? Uh, part of it, I think, uh, do, and rightly so, uh, points to the power and stature of Paul in those days as one who was leading and shaping the church of the Lord 
Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and he'll actually have more to say about his role in all of that before this chapter is done. I also think this is a picture of the larger scene of, of what is going on in a sense. Uh, one of the things that has been going on is Paul going from body of Christians to body of Christians doing what he could to fan the flame of life in all of those places and some were doing well and some were not doing so well. And so, so what he does for Eutychus, Paul was trying to do for churches as he spent his life in terms of bringing churches to life and then going back and visiting with them and writing letters to them in order to keep them alive in Christ. And so in a sense, I'm taking this little episode uh, that happened with Eutychus and, and what, what was done to keep him alive is something then that is, uh, is representative of all that Paul had been doing up until this point. And that's, it, in a sense, that concludes uh, in, in the personal way, it concludes at the end of Acts chapter 20 because as we've said two or three times before, what's going on here or Paul's last days as a free man. By the time he gets to Jerusalem, which Luke covers that rather quickly, by the time he gets to Jerusalem and then there's an episode there that will put Paul in incarceration. And from that moment on until the conclusion of the book of Acts, Paul is in someone's custody. And so uh, what, what goes on here is, is really, really significant in terms of seeing this as a model and a summit for Paul's ministry. And there's even more to come before, as I would say, uh, we leave this, this chapter. Uh, it's also a very encouraging memory for Troas as a church. Just think for how many years people would be. And, and when Eutychus was an old man, uh, people would want to tell the story again. And then one more thing, Eutychus means lucky. <laughs> uh, it would seem to me that would be one of the reasons why Luke had to tell this story. There's some other things, of course, and some very important things about the nature of the church and how the church functioned in the first century and the purpose of the assembling on the first day of the week. All of that is something that is very, very significant for us because I think in a way, uh, as I said, I think in the previous lesson, there are two, um, yeah, I'd say Acts 2 and Acts 20 and Acts 2.38 and Acts 20 and 7 are Bible verses out of my upbringing that have truly shaped uh, who we are and who I am as a follower of Jesus Christ. I, in a way, I don't think you can overemphasize how important uh, these, these two verses have been to us. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Asus, intending to take Paul aboard there for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. No explanation as to why. And when he met us at Asos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day we touched at Samos. And the day after that, we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia. For he was hastening to be in Jerusalem if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them. Well, let's take a look at this geographically. So here's Troas. Paul, uh, most of the group, took a ship from Troas that would come around uh, this point of land and come in to port at Asos, and then notice how all of these places are mentioned, Mytilene, Chios, uh, down to Samos, all the way to Miletus. Uh, uh, all of these were very likely what Luke, because he was on board the ship all that time, 
What very likely what he's doing is this is where they put in to port every night instead of sailing through the night because it's along the coastline and they wanted to be t very careful that they didn't run aground somewhere. And so they would put in to port for the night and very likely those are the places. And so this would be about a five-day sail from Troas to Miletus if indeed that's the way it was done. And then we also note, uh, and that's kind of strange, that, but the explanation is Paul wanted to be in uh, Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost, and he knew <clears throat> that if he went to Ephesus, there were just too many people there. Uh, he, he would have to spend time with those brethren. And so the salute, but he wanted to, he really wanted to talk to the elders at Ephesus, and we'll, we'll begin to discover why. So, we notice Luke's personal participation that is noted by the details of this portion of the journey. He avoided delay in Ephesus. He wanted to be in, in, uh, in um, Jerusalem by Pentecost. And so there's going to be a meeting at Miletus. Miletus was about 90, 199 miles from Asos. And this is a modern picture of the little port of Asos. Miletus was actually a pretty large city. This is a picture of the ruins of the theater in Miletus, and you can see how large it is, and that overlooks ruins of a, of a, it wouldn't be in Ephesus, it's not as large as Ephesus, but it's a large town, which then makes, uh, it's kind of interesting that there's no mention of a church there or Paul meeting with disciples there, and you would think with Luke traveling with the group, if there had been one, uh, that would have been done. Nevertheless, uh, in a sense, there are you know, places where time is limited, space is limited, all of that. So Luke just has to uh, say very quickly, uh, describe some events that took a lot longer and involved a lot more people. And so, so he's going to call for the elders uh, from, Melita, uh, from Ephesus to meet with him. And, uh, and uh, they're going to walk uh, ab about, uh, I had a note in here, and it's not right here on, on this slide, but um, I think about 25, 30 miles, something like that from Ephesus to Miletus was, was the journey that they would have had to take. So you could see this would take a little bit of time to, to, to accomplish. Well, we come now as the conclusion of Acts chapter 20 to another very important sermon of the Apostle Paul. There are three sermons of the Apostle. We've already heard the first two. The first one was to a synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia, the longest uh, piece of sermon that, uh, Luke, uh, that Paul preaches in, in the book of Acts as we have it. And then there's the sermon to the Areopagus on the Areopagus in Athens in Acts 17. And now this sermon, which will be addressed to Christians, specifically the shepherds of the church in Ephesus. Well, I, I'm going to, to stop there. Um, let's see. Now, I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and read this sermon as the conclusion of this lesson, and then in the lesson to follow, we'll read it again and pick up from there and, and look at some of the things that are said. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what it will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, 
I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the, God, the, the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend to you, uh, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. I think I'll conclude there. There's nothing personal word that Paul will conclude this sermon with, but we'll pick up there. I really do appreciate the opportunity to go through this with you. And there is so much here in this sermon that's so important to the church in our day and time. And I pray that you'll be with us in the lesson to follow. Thank you again for being here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.